going to have uh, readings now. There are going to be three readings, all from Exodus. And I understand that Lance, Joffrey, and Charlotte are going to bring those to us now. Exodus chapter 8, verse 16 to 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the, gr strike the dust off the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust off the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen. Just as the Lord had said, then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on your on you and your officials, on your people and to, into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. Exodus 9 to 7, the plague on livestock. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Peru and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible bleak on your livestock in the field on your horses donkeys and camels, and on your cattle, sheep and goats, but the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belongings to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said tomorrow, the Lord will, be, will do this in the land, and not the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding, and he would let, not let the people go. Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform the signs of mine among them that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I'm the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors nor have even seen seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses turned and left, to, left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be as near to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Did, do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? May the Lord bless this word. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to ask David to come up now. I'm going to pray for him before he shares with us. Lord, we thank you um, for David. We thank you that he's able to be with us here this morning. We thank you for all the preparation that he's done. And I just pray that you would, you would pour out your blessing on him this morning, that you would lead him and guide him even as he speaks to us. And would you give us open hearts and ears to hear from you? Lord, help us to hear your challenge, to hear your comfort, and just to be open to whatever it is you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here again and keep the relationship between the two churches alive because we want to keep it alive since it's in such a good condition. Um, so Claire's uh, Basewood Road and I'm here with you and you know, I've got you know, my instructions from Claire to continue with this journey of Exodus. So, is that, no? If we just go into the next slide please. The plagues. We've got plagues today. Yipty do. <laughs> and sometimes when we um, engage with passages like this, you know, we've seen films about the story and we're familiar with different bits and we sometimes struggle to think beyond the story. You know, what relevance does this have for you, for me, today? So hopefully as we kind of take this whistle-stop tour of chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10 of Exodus, we'll have a few highlights to inspire, to challenge, and help us move forward in our faith. And I would just encourage you, if you haven't done it before, to read or listen to all those chapters continuously as one chunk. What you might discover might surprise you. So please do engage with God's word before you see the films. See the, hear, read the real story before you see the creative thing. But in, in conversations sometimes, people kind of say things like, um, you know, this is meant to be a God of justice, a God of mercy, a God of compassion. And you've got chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. And if we just looked at the chapters all by themselves, you could have a tendency to be a bit confused. You know, let's just put our hands up and say, this is a legitimate opportunity for confusion. But I know that you've been working your way through systematically up until this point. So what I'm about to share with you won't be news, but I do want to remind you. Because it helps to put 7, 8, 9, and 10 in perspective. By the point, at this point, Moses is 80 years old. But at the time of his birth, the situation in Egypt was such that he was born under a death sentence. His people that were welcomed into Egypt with open arms because one of their favorite sands was a, a huge blessing, not just to Egypt, but to the entire region, that him and his household and his extended family were honored guests in the nation. And Pharaoh had a special place for him and his extended family. But 
for the last 80 years. Every person that's been born that's part of that family whose male was under a death sentence. The people were enslaved. 80 years worth of slavery. You can look back over history, even today, and think about different situations of struggle, of conflict, and make your comparisons. But the backdrop is 80 years, continuous slavery under a death sentence. Because scripture at no point indicates that the law was ever changed. Even if it wasn't enforced as rigorously as it was at the beginning, it's still out there. So when we come to the plagues, we need to remember Egypt's attitude towards the people of Hebrew, the people of Jacob, Moses' extended family, but also towards the God that they worship. If we have the next slide, please. Yes. I am versus Pharaoh. This is the contest. This is the setup. This is the backdrop to what's going on. You've had the burning bush meeting last week. God declares who he is. One of his uh, illustrious names, his sacred name, I am. What does that mean? It means I am. But it's I am against Pharaoh. You might think that's not a fair battle. But Pharaoh is considered a god in Egypt. He's considered the personification, the highlight of all the Egyptian gods. Not just one, but all of them. And in particular, their most famous god, the sun god, Ra, Pharaoh is meant to be the earthly manifestation of. So I think this is a worthy challenge for the God that calls himself I am to say, okay then, Pharaoh, you think you're a God. This is how you've been treating my people. Eight years of slavery under a death sentence. The God who is just, who is compassionate and is merciful, decides to step in. And in kind of chapter 10 of the various sections that were read for us, it highlights this contest. This is not just about some nasty things that happen to some people as bad as those things are. But it's about the situation between who is really God. You say you're God in this territory, and I am says I'm God everywhere, including your territory. And God, the I am, is prepared to demonstrate it and get into a battle, into a contest. If you were into your boxing, you might see like the two pictures you know, and verses and happening here tonight. Heavyweight champions in the world. I am versus Pharaoh. If we have the next slide, please. The magicians lack power. Verse 8 of the passage. But when the magicians uh, tried to produce gnats from their secret arts, they could not. 
And the gnats were on people and animals. Chapter 8, verse 18. So far in this contest, God has been sending Moses and Aaron, basically saying, I'm the God of the Hebrew people. This is what I'm going to do. And my representatives here, Aaron and Moses, are going to make sure it happens. It's happened. And then Pharaoh's gone to his representatives and say, well, come on, guys. Can you not do the same things? And up until this point, they have been able to match the signs that have taken place. They have been able to copy what God has done. Not initiate, but copy. And what that says to me is that there is some real power in these other authorities. Significant power that can change things, that can disrupt things. And we would be naive if we didn't realise that those that want to stand against God do legitimately have power and authority that can disturb and shake up our environment. Whether that's through laws, regulations, culture, or through spiritual activity, there is real power and real things happen. But they are limited because all they can do is copy. And the strange thing, or possibly even the laughable thing about it, is by copying what God has done, they make the situation worse and not better. You know, Nile turns to blood, all the fish die. They copy it, there's some more blood. Moses, on the other hand, can make it turn to blood and can turn it back again. Reverse what was done in the first place. So healing and wholeness is manifest and restored. As the situation goes on and on up until this point. And then the magicians have to say, okay, we give up. God has done this. This is by the finger of God. We've tried our best. We've had our top specialists come in, our world experts. And we can't do that. We can't do that. So the magicians have limited power. If we go on to the next slide, please. God's people are distinctive. Chapter 8, verse 22. But on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I am the Lord, am in this land. Remember, Pharaoh and the God of the Egyptians, this is meant to be their home turf. This is their home stadium. They are, you know, yeah, they've got all their fans, all their supporters. But God says, in this part of your land where my people live, I will make a distinction. I will show that I'm actually in the land on your turf and you can do absolutely nothing about it. God makes a distinction. This plague will happen all over there, but in this space it will not which is brilliant for the the Hebrew people. They get to experience, you know, positive uplift. Hey, we're having a good time, at least for a few days. But there's also a couple of things to notice about what happens. Firstly, that the Hebrew people do absolutely nothing to achieve this. They are the recipients of God's grace in this situation. The distinctiveness 
is simply by the action and activity and the grace of God. It's not that they're any better people than the Egyptians. It's simply that God wants to make a distinction between those that will worship him and those that do not. And so the question that it raises for me is, what's, what does this mean for us? Should there be a God distinctive about us as we are worshipping him? Surely, if there's any uh, situation that we are the recipients of God's grace, God's blessing, not because of anything that we have done, but simply because of what he has done, that is in a magnitude, magnified and personified in the life, the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Jesus says you can have a wonderful relationship with the creator of the world if you say yes to me. And that's it. It's got nothing to do with anything any of us may or may not have done. And so... If we've said yes to Jesus, if we consider ourselves to be his disciples and worshiping this true God, then what's the distinctive? Or what distinctives should we be reflecting in our life? Is there any distinctiveness about our life as we worship this God? Not because we are special, but because of what God has done for each one of us that says yes to him. When people look at our lives, friends, neighbours, work colleagues, family, at that social event, is there anything distinctive about it? Is there anything they can look to and say, yeah, that person is a Christian. That person is a follower of Jesus. Not because of they've told you, you've told them, but there's something about your life that's a signpost, that's pointing towards Jesus. If we go to the next slide, please. Ambition crushed. Chapter 10, verse 7 says, Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a sneer to us? Let the people go that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is ruined? Now, before we get too excited... This is not the Egyptian officials saying, oh yes, we want to worship this God as well. There's no sense of conversion. This is just pragmatism. This is, we've come to the realisation that what God has done amongst us has ruined the nation. Come on, Pharaoh. Why are you keeping these people in this place any longer? Your ambition has been crushed. See, at the start, if you look back into Exodus chapter 1, and that transition from a place of privilege for the people, the Pharaoh says, well, they're getting too numerous. And so we need to act wisely. We need to be crafty. We need to be protective. Because if they turn against us, then we lose our economy. We lose our influence. We lose our position of, you know, being looked up to in the world. So in order to sustain our place of privilege, we need to treat them badly. The complete opposite 
has now materialized. That passage that was read for us in chapter 9, the first seven verses, was a plague against uh, animals. And you might think, you know, God, why did you pick on the animals? The animals are fine. But each of these plagues is not simply an attack on those things. They all symbolize gods in Egypt. So each animal type represents a different god. I didn't want to kind of list all the gods because there's a long list. <laughs> but in the animal section, there's two types of cow. There's the male and the heifer, and they're both gods. And then you've got the horses. And you think the horses, and they're fine. But they're Egypt's military power. And then you've got, you know, the sheep and the goats. I mean, the sheep and the goats, they're cuddly. That's economic food production. And then you've got the pack animals. This is their transport infrastructure. God has attacked every single um, kind of personification of might and strength in the nation. So it's ambition crushed by the hand of God, as well as saying, you think these are gods. I will show you who is God. But what about us? Let's bring it home. Let's bring it personal. What about our ambition? Are we kind of off chasing film, fame or wealth or money, greed? Maybe we're putting our families above God or our careers above God. Good things, helpful things. But if they're in the wrong place, if you put them above the one who is I am, then the I am has something to say about it. Because he says, I am God. None of these things are. You can have them, but they need to be in the right place. God has crushed the ambition of fairy, Pharaoh and of Egypt. Hopefully, he doesn't have to crush yours or mine, but we can lift him up to the right place and then he won't need to. And hopefully we've got one more slide. Yeah. Culture seeks compromise. Towards the end of the plagues, um, Pharaoh mellows his tone a little bit. Not a great deal, but a little bit. And it's worthy of note. He comes to the realisation that he's on a bit of a sticky wicket and that he's dealing with God and God always wins. Um, and it's like, oh, you've done it again, Moses. Okay, you know, I'll let the people go, get rid of this. Moses goes off, prays every time. Great amount of compassion. Please, God, bring it to an end. And once the situation is over, once the stress is off of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, ah, not interested. Change my mind. But towards the latter stages, it's like, well, you can, I can go, but... I'm not sure if all of you should go. Maybe just the men. Or maybe just take some of the animals. Or maybe you just go over there instead of go away for three days. Pharaoh 
tries to negotiate with Moses about what is legitimate worship and what is not. He's trying to adjust, he's trying to squeeze, he's trying to compromise. He's trying to create something that is comfortable for him, convenient for him, that kind of helps support him in his situation and his economy and his ambition and his desires rather than freely allow the people of God to worship God in the terms that God has sent to them. And when we look around at the world that we live in, how many times do we butt up against this kind of situation where culture is pressing us to adjust what we do and how we live because they don't want us to fully worship God for who he is under the terms that he's expressed to us? Moses was consistent in his refusal to compromise on worship. And what did that do? What did that achieve for Moses? It wasn't just a bumpy ride. I believe something in Moses changed. Last week, you had the burning bush encounter. And one of the well-known things about the burning bush encounter, besides the actual bush being ablaze, is the long list of excuses Moses comes up with. Lord, yes, but what about this? And 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 in the end, he says, well, Lord, why don't you just send somebody else? Please, Lord. Send them. But by the end of this series of encounters, because he was unwilling to compromise, because he knew his God, he became stronger in his faith. Yes, it was bumpy. Yes, there was pressure. Yes, Pharaoh wanted to resist him in every way possible. But as he started to his worship of his God, as he accurately understood it, Moses was the one that became stronger, not weaker. Is this our experience today? Or has culture compromised us rather than us growing in strength in our worship to him? So to conclude, God is merciful. He is compassionate. When we understand the picture accurately, we can understand the grace of God. The opposition is real and it is powerful, but it has limited power and authority when in comparison to God. The God wants to make a distinction between his people and other people. Not because they've done or we've done anything, but because of all that he does for us. If we're not careful, we could put other things in God's place. And that might mean for us, our ambition could be crushed. And ultimately, he wants us to grow in confidence, in worshipping him as he has defined, rather than as culture seeks us to compromise. What is the Lord saying to you through these plagues from many years ago? Let's just have a moment to make a commitment, a commitment to worship God and not be compromised.
by the culture around us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are truly a great and awesome God, that we can trust you, we can depend on you and your words, and we want to seek to worship you in spirit and in truth, and help us to grow in confidence in you, that our worship is fully expressed to you and that we're not compromised by the culture around us. In Jesus' name, amen.